Hi, good evening. Um, Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, you're welcome to another all right. So, you're welcome to another episode of um, Market Edge um, series. And so, tonight I'll have um, okay, that my guest shortly i can see him already so um he's just trying to connect and so i want to all right perfect yeah good evening hi good evening Kisayo. all right perfect i i can see you now good evening hello all right good evening Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I'm trying to get. All right, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, perfect. So I can hear you now. Um, and so I have my guest here tonight. Um, Sire is there to, um help with um, the topic we'll be considering tonight. And so I will want us to um, start straight up so that we can stay within the one hour that um, we have for the session tonight. And so um, I'd like to go straight to the first question so I don't waste the time and we can um, and a lot of questions as possible tonight. Um, you know, Marquise is quite um, popular with Nigeria's um, market. Um, the reports are quite um, robust and very popular with people, both people who make investments and people who get to benefit or otherwise. So there was a report in 2014 here eh, that McKinsey um, wrote on inclusive growth in Nigeria. And so they had a couple of, um, you know, several numbers, but I will just um, leave it to like a few numbers to guide this question. So there was one on potential growth for Nigeria. Uh, they looked at 7.1% uh, annual GDP growth. They said Nigeria is going to achieve that by 2030. Um, they also projected Nigeria will be one of the top 20 economies in the world by 2030. Um, GDP of more than $1.6 trillion. They were quite bullish on Nigeria. 160 million people in consuming cars. Um, that's even more than the population of France and Germany. Uh, they're looking at potential 120 million Nigerians mm. to move above empowerment line and for 70 million people to move out of poverty it is 2020 already 2030 is just 10 years out so are we on track <laughs> are we on track uh i think i think we're definitely off track uh uh and i understand uh well that nigeria held a lot of promise to so many people and seem to have shattered a lot of those promises as well. So it's, I don't think Zuni McKinsey is disappointed about uh, our performance as a country. Uh, I think I am disappointed myself. Uh, quite a number of other people uh, are disappointed. And I think it's, it's, it's just, you know, uh, that's something that we all feel about, okay, this country holds so much promise for, for, uh, for a lot of us and for people that, that seem to associate themselves with us, uh, but we've not just delivered on end of those. 
but of course, uh, people have said that uh, it's not all doom and gloom, right? Uh, but I think if you don't even understand where the problem started from or how to solve, uh, how we got here, you probably won't figure out how how to get out. Uh, oh. I mean, I think there's some few basic things that we need to get uh, set as a country. Uh, how many are we? Simple questions. How many are we as a country? We don't know. We don't know the exact number of people that live in this country. Uh, you know, let alone now say, can we plan for each, you know, for everybody? Can we ensure that no one is left behind? Uh, I mean, this problem was, was, uh, was brought back to our face again during this uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, that we've been dealing with for some time. Even Lagos, as forward, I mean, as far ahead as Lagos is to a lot of people, we don't know the number of residents in this, in, in this state. We don't know who are the most vulnerable people in this state. We don't know, we practically don't know any, anything about anybody. I was having a conversation with some people a few days ago, uh, and I was telling them that even my bank thinks that I live in Ojudu Bega, and this is the first place I lived in when I moved to Lagos. I've changed houses three times, right? So they still think that I live in Bega. I mean, when, when I say my, my state, my account, yeah, I just say, oh, Ojudu Bega, oh God, <laughs> these guys are still thinking I'm, I'm still in this house, right? <laughs> And that's the way, even from, the, from government to, to, to private sector, nothing, we don't know anything about anybody. And I think that's where to start from. You know, for now, start from, okay, yeah, election, transparency, leadership, and all of the other, uh, you know, esoteric type uh, stuff that we would like to get into uh, very deeply. So we're off track. Nothing totally off track. To that El Dorado that 2030 represents. Nothing. You know, we always had visions from uh, Vision 2020, Vision, you know, um, Millennium. You know, we, we just typically, you know, shifted forward because we never, I mean, it's great to see where I should be in 30 years. I can see it myself. I mean, sitting out here, I know what my life should be when I'm 60, right? But if I don't take steps today, I won't achieve anything. And that's, and that's where we are as a nation, where, uh, you know, We've seen ourselves that yes, we have this vision 2020. The, the sad part, the, the sad part here yeah. is this, um, so when these reports come out, it, it, it paints a glorious picture, a bright picture of an emerging middle class, of a literate mm -hmm. middle class, of yeah. a middle class with buying power to make effective demands. So a lot of businesses are built around this promise. I, and I guess that's one um, thing that has impacted the growth of, the, of tech in Nigeria. Uh, so I'm going to mm -hmm. move to the next topic here. Um, in early 2010, um, we had businesses around e-commerce. We had Jumia, we had Conga, we had Superman. Um, they were all selling groceries, appliances. Um, people are just had to download hubs. I mean, they were having good time and then the future looked extremely good as well so we moved from just e-commerce we had agri-tech um edutech everybody tried to take advantage of that gap build businesses around it and then try to become the next mark but then this is 2020 and it's 10 years after most of the promising tech startups of 2010 are mm -hmm. either dead or struggling. What do you think the issues are? Okay, so uh, I think I wrote an article some time ago, I mean, referencing some of these uh, McKinsey reports uh, around, uh, you know, this data sets that you've, uh, that you've discussed, right? I think that the problem we have as, as, as business people, is that sometimes we read some of these reports to make decisions. I mean, McKinsey is a great, is a great you know, consulting firm, no, no doubt about that, right? Uh, however, when it comes to uh, the situation of Nigeria specifically, I think that building something for the middle class, I mean, the middle class does not exist as a class. If it exists, it's too thin to build a product for. And again, I'll explain. It only took two weeks for Lagos, which is meant to be the richest part of the country, to start experiencing social unrest 
because of the lockdown. Two weeks. One, two. Two weeks of people not earning daily. Two weeks of people not going to work. And suddenly, armed robbery, you know, case of armed robbery increased, you know, cases of, of you know, starching of, of, I mean, specifically armed robbery just started spiking within two weeks. It shows something around the fragility uh, of, of the economy as, as well. But back to the question around uh, the growing middle class. Uh, I, I seem to have a theory, especially for the e-commerce uh, play. I think they came ahead of their time. And I'll explain why I thought so. By the time they came, payment infrastructure had not been fully built out. Interstitch was just getting its feet ready. There was no pay stack, there was no flutter wave. So it means that payment was not solved. When they came, logistics was still a nightmare. We we're still all dependent on night posts, you know, to ensure that that, that letters are moved, right? So it means that these people had to invest in delivery infrastructure themselves, raise a lot of money to buy trucks, to buy you know, vans to buy bikes so they can move their goods ahead, right? But today, some of those problems seem to have been solved. At least payments, at least card payments to, to a large extent had been dealt with. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, delivery infrastructure, at least in Lagos, uh, business that are built specifically for that purpose, right? So once those two things were not solved, it means that the, the e-commerce businesses had to go, go back to build that. Number one, distract them from their core focus of building, you know, product for their customers and all of that. I also think that the craze of building for Nigeria got into a lot of their heads. I mean, again, maybe a few years ago, I wrote an article around why I think Konga shouldn't try to be uh, an online mall for the whole of Nigeria, because all of Nigeria is not viable. Lagos is viable. Focus on that. Maybe Abuja is, value, uh, is, is viable. Focus on that city. Maybe Portacot can be slightly valuable. Focus on that. Maybe Ibadan is focus on those places and then build, rather than try to build you know, for a consumer in Borno, a consumer in Bauchi, that might not actually care about how all of these things work. So I felt they tried to build you know, for everybody too fast, and then people were not necessarily uh, at that point. But I think the primary problem, again, is that the class of people they are trying to build for are not uh, large enough. And the people that can afford to do some business can also afford to buy on Amazon, can afford to buy you know, from the UK, from the US, I, would rather, I mean, people would rather do that than to buy from Konga. And then finally, I think they, they, they lost the trust of people because the pictures we see online is not, they are typically not what, what we get, you know, when it's, full, uh, when it's finally delivered, right? So once that trust is lost, it's hard to build it back, right? So for me, I thought a few of those things where the mistakes they made. Of course, everybody is great with, with, with hindsight, right? Uh, I mean, we know what went wrong. We, could, we can look back mm -hmm. and see this is what they did wrong, right? But I'm just saying that in all of this, I thought if we had, you know, uh, you know, available, and then of course, they delivered on their own primary promise of like, this is the picture you saw, this is what you're going to get. I thought uh, the outcome could have been better. So what, what of edutech, um, ed, education? It, it, it's, it's, yeah. Education should be viable, but, yep. but it's they're struggling. Yes. And agitech uh, as well. Yes. Uh, so on, on agitech um, firms right now. Okay, so. In ad tech, uh, that's people trying to solve the aggregate value chain problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought we've seen one model that, this, that we are seeing to be popular right now is crowdfunding. So crowd, crowdfunding of farms. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting model. You know, farm crowding, tribe agree, quite a number of people had pioneered you know, that model. But of course, we start seeing copycats and, you know, these things happen every time. Yeah. So you just see, see, see a few successes and then start building around that. However, I think my biggest problem is that this value chain, uh, these tech companies are focusing on the, on the least profitable part of farming, primary agriculture. The least profitable, the lowest margin, and the hardest primary agriculture. So it means that you're raising money from people to finance 
platforms, uh, you know, primary agriculture where a few things can happen. Locusts can show up, you know, uh, flood might show up, you know, droughts might show up, right? Any of these things can totally change the outcome for you, right? Uh, you, you're financing that, and then your margins are also thin. So you don't have that huge margin of error. Even if you lost a few, you probably have lost all, right? So I thought that that was, that was a big uh, source of concern for me. And I think that, yes, maybe that's why they're struggling, maybe not, right? For EdTech, I think it's a big infrastructure problem, or maybe not necessarily discerning the, the need of the people you are serving, uh, you're solving the, the, the problem for. So again, uh, EdTech that we've seen, try to build you know, stuff for you online to read. But internet, broadband internet service is still not available in many places, right? Again, that's an infrastructure problem, uh, right? Uh, parents, a lot of times, we are building for, for children. Parents actually want their children to leave the house, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've heard complaints from parents during this lockdown around, okay, I think I appreciate my teachers, who, uh, my son's teachers work better now because how can anybody teach this four-year-old guy that doesn't listen to any instruction, right? So parents actually want their children to leave. Like, I don't have time for you today. Just be going, right? So solving that problem with technology is not going to happen because I want that child out of my house. <laughs> At least for that few hours, I won't be around. I can deal with him when he comes back in the evening. I may be managing him during weekends, right? But he needs to leave the house. So using technology to solve some of those problems can be far-reaching because you probably can't, you know, because the problem you want to be solved, uh, don't, want to, uh, don't want to get solved. I think the base of ed tech is infrastructure. Uh, broadband internet, uh, and then finally, I think it's the same thing we discussed here, you know, initially around uh, the middle class you're building it for. You know, the middle class you're building it for, how, how huge are they? Outside of Lagos, Abuja, Border Court, where else can your market be, you know? So it's just those concerns around. Yeah, like now, um, we, I mean, the last question talked about two phases of, of, of tech firms, the inception, mm -hmm. And at the period where we found out they were either struggling or where some of them came out to announce that they were just shutting down. Um, so it's become a trend in, in, in the tech space that three sets of information filled out to the market. One, when they come out as a new star to look out for, there's a new project in town, they're going to solve every problem that has to deal with this and that. And then the next thing, you hear that, okay, they just attracted one hundred million dollars you just waste this set of funds that's the next information that you get then the next information you are going to get is that they are either dead or struggling <laughs> there is a disconnect are they really profitable are tech firms really efficient <clears throat> okay uh you know, I'm in the ecosystem, right? So I have to be careful of the things I say. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, uh, but that's just jokes apart. I think that uh, technology firms made, again, some, mistake, some mistakes early when, we, when this ecosystem started building up. We focused on the wrong things, right? I think also that the problem started when we started making entrepreneurship a thing of joy, like, I'm now an entrepreneur. No, I mean, it's like, if someone tells me, I'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. That's what I would tell them, because I know it is hard. If I try to run a business before, this thing is really hard, right? But we made it so, look so great. I mean, when you see announcements of founders, they'll put their hands together and then take pictures, and you're like, wow, okay, this, this is the cool thing. So, we made entrepreneurship look cool. This thing is not cool. Let's be clear. Right? So you're running a business. It's hard. Once we get that state, so it's not, it's not celebrity status. It's not David Doe and Bonaboy. No. It is, real, it is hard work. And I think a lot of people don't recognize how hard this thing is before they jump into it. And I tell people, if you don't have to start a business now, go and get a job. You will learn the things to do while you're working. You will learn the things how to run a business while working with someone else. 
I don't think all of us have to go and start a company immediately we leave, we leave school. But that idea around, okay, yeah, this young graduate changing the world from Ife, I mean, you guys are, you guys are complicit in this, <laughs> and I blame Ife people. I blame you, <laughs> you specifically for this, right? Uh, right, so these guys just came out from university, they built this great product, and everybody's after them. But that thing is really hard. Most of you recognize that it's hard. Then we now come to the odds of success in Nigeria. Now, I'm saying entrepreneurship is hard in, in the old world, generally. Starting a new business is hard, generally in the old world. But in Nigeria, your odds are higher. Right? So it means that you're dealing with you're dealing with your village people, you're dealing with you know human beings that are just out, you know, to swindle you. It has to be. <laughs> I'm serious. This thing is. I mean, I was I was talking to someone uh, recently about a product around uh, an insurance product in 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 one other emerging market. I think is 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 Singapore. Is is around insurance product, a car insurance product that that is linked to uh, to the to your rights. So like you pay insurance based on your your trips. I'm like hmm. in Nigeria, people will claim that their cars are parked. But no, the cars are on the road. Right? So yeah, there, there are a lot of things you have to deal with in with people with people that are just out. I mean, I know of of, of, of a lending company that got swindled by by students from university. They went to buy SIM, register, borrow, throw it the same. These are the things you deal with as a business owner in Nigeria, right? You have to announce, okay, your other hire run this business in Nigeria. So it's hard enough running a business. Why is Nigeria is harder, right? But because we made it seem cool, is where people now feel, yeah, okay, ah, they look down on us that are working for other people. Like, uh, you, okay, you people that you are, you are, you are, you are not your own boss. <laughs> okay, great. You are your own boss. Continue being your boss, right? But I think that this thing is, is, is hard enough, right? Uh, and the other sources are sincerely very, uh, very hard. After that, then I think the other thing is that new businesses that are coming up need to recognize again that. I'm solving a problem, and I think you need to solve for that problem. You know, uh, a lot of times I think I see people building, solving problems that they themselves don't necessarily understand uh, the problem we are solving. You probably not experienced the problem. You've not seen the problem right in action. You just think that you can build a cool technology to solve this cool problem, right? It's it's still you know that problem, products problem fit needs to be add you know add strong. Uh, the question asked me is that is this a multivitamin or a painkiller? Again, it's it's general question. Is it a multivitamin or painkiller? People add, or is it a candy? Where I mean, candy is just sweet. You, you can decide to have it or not. A multivitamin, yeah, maybe you take multivitamin once in five years. It's great. But a painkiller, if you have this excruciating headache, you need something to solve this problem today. Are you building for a problem that the people want to, want to get solved? Example I give, there's a company in the U.S. called WAG. Uh, it's a dog walking app. It means that there's an app, and it's a billion dollar company, by the way. The app's job is to link you to people that can help you walk your dog. I'll see people that want to try and copy that, that type of, of model in Nigeria. I'm like, huh, really? Number one, how many people have dogs? How big is the problem, <laughs> you know, of dog walking in Nigeria? When people are still hungry, about food, you know? So it's just the way entrepreneurship is and the kind of problem you're trying to solve. So I said all of that to say that, yes, entrepreneurship is hard. Your also said in Nigeria is, is harder, but we should stop showing people just the cool side of entrepreneurship alone. We should show them the hard part of entrepreneurship as well, uh, which is why what all we see is the fundraising announcements. I mean, even people that raise hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars just start firing people, you know? Uh, in the, in the past week, right? So this thing is hard. Uh, and I think it's, it's one thing that people need to recognize and recognize properly that yes, this thing is too hard to just be, it's be, uh, be taken with uh, just unprepared uh, for some of the challenges that we face in there. So, so, so right now, um, like you rightly said, it's hard, but right now that's, that's we moved from probably the period where um, it was e-commerce, 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 where it was, mm -hmm. it, we're, now, we're now in an other era where if you are doing 
a fintech startup. You are the next star. So, so, mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's the fintech era right now. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they're probably trying. Probably. Trying. Maybe not. But Maybe yeah, not. That's, that's what I'm going to ask for your opinion because you see the numbers. You see the numbers. You, you, you know what is really happening. What is really happening in that space right now? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so I, think, I think one thing that we've seen is that everywhere in the world, there are always fast followers. So I, mean, right. I don't think it's the wrong thing, right? So e-commerce, Jumia Konga, Glue, everybody showed up on the table. Uh, FinTech lending, you know, pay later, you know, quick check, people just showed up. Savings, piggy bank, you know, uh, farm crowdy, tribe agree, pop money, people just show up once they see that this can be remotely successful from the beginning. And I don't think it's, it's, a, wrong, it's a wrong thing because, hey, I mean, back in my days, in my former life, I tried to start a saving company, but I just found out that, yeah, this thing can be, can be tricky, especially when the interest environments are not necessarily as, uh, are not are trending downwards, things might happen, all of that kind of things, you know. But because I had the expertise, I thought it was something I could just, you know, start as well. So I'm just saying that that thing around uh, bandwagon, you know, effect, it's not a Nigerian phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon, and people do that right. every time, Right. But that said, uh, I think, yes, fintech is, fintech seems to be getting a lot of media attention. This is what I said, media attention. Uh, okay. Because they believe they are solving, uh, again, cool problems here and there. Payment has been solved, which is the background of, of all of this. Once payment is solved, uh, at least to a large extent, it's easier to now build products on top of that, which is, so for me, in all of this, uh, here's sort of a number of things you said. Paystack, Flutter Wave, at the bedrock, and InterSwitch, basically. Uh, well, InterSwitch is the grandfather. They, they just put on InterSwitch, right? Uh, so they're the bedrock of the successes we've been seeing in tech to a large extent. Uh, and I would compare this thing. I think that's the lesson I write about, the Nigerian ecosystem and, and Kenya. If you see the kind of business that are thriving in Kenya, you see business like, like Trigger, Trigger Foods, we, that allows... People to buy bananas, cocoa, I mean, bananas, yam, you know, traders, petty traders, to be able to use technology and interact with it. But that's because they've learned to use M-Pesa, right? So it improves all of that. But in Nigeria, you still have not built a product for the malam like selling just on the street because it can't use technology as, as well, because it can't use car, it doesn't have POS, it doesn't have all of that. But in, in, in Kenya, it's totally different because they, they all use M-Pesa anyway. Uh, so if you don't use MPSA, you, you are the problem. In Nigeria, if you don't use cash, you are the problem, uh, which is the difference uh, in the two ecosystems. But I said all of that to say, okay, why is FinTech getting a lot of attention today? Uh, I think that the, the direction of the press has been, has been, the press is putting too much focus on that because I did some analysis around, uh, around what they're building. And I still found out that in my head, the banks will still win this game. In my head, I still... My bet is that the banks will still continue to uh, to rule this game. GC Bank just last last I mean their year end had focused so much on just their USSD products, Star Seven Thirty Seven, right? And they've beaten almost all the fintechs I know to it, right? Uh, their cost income ratio is 44 percent, so it means that they make a naira, they spend forty four naira. I don't know any fintech in Nigeria that has that efficiency. Yes, they, they I mean, so I think, I mean, just to summarize what, what I'm saying, it is a battle between distribution and innovation. So who gets, who gets there first? Would a first bank get innovative first or will Kauri Wise get distribution first? Is the, is the, is the, is the you know, so is, who gets what first? Will first bank be more innovative tomorrow, faster than how piggy bank or carbon will get distribution? Because what fintech is looking for is that distribution, having to be able to get Dangote's accounts. They can't get it today because they don't have access. But people that have it are not as innovative, right? So the point is that will the dinosaurs get innovative faster? Or will the fintechs 
get distribution faster. For me, which one is easier? Distribution is harder to get. Innovation is easier to get. My bet, right? So, I, so my bet remains that if G2 Bank continues to lead in innovation the way they are leading today in the banking, it's easier to copy what this bank is, has done. Because that's what they all do. This bank releases star 737. Everybody releases star something, 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 ash. True. Right? So once there's a leader of that part that keeps getting innovative, other banks will get that innovative edge too to get to themselves and potentially win this battle against, against new technology or new entrants uh, based on how hard they try. And so my bet as we, will, will be that uh, the banks will get technology first uh, than fintechs get innovation. I mean, than fintechs get in distribution. <laughs> so, 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 okay, then that, that leads me to my next question. There's, there's this growing hype around fintech startups that they have mm -hmm. come to displace commercial banks as we know it. So, so again, I mean, I see, um, like, now, if I, um, the code, I get credit in few seconds. Seconds. No need for any collateral, nothing, because probably they have my history with my accounts. So they're able to deploy that. Access Bank has the same. They give out credit at far lower rates relative to some of these loans uh, platforms. Again, does it look like fintech startups are about to displace traditional banks as you know it, looking at the numbers, looking at the edge, looking at size? I don't think so. Uh, but again, there are a few things we need to, uh, to recognize. What I think is that, so I give an example in, in some articles I've written before around uh, how I got my first bank account, right? I was a student. I, have to, I mean, I had to leave home and, and go to school. So I was not a, I was a useful client to the bank as it were, because all I needed the accounts for, so my mom to send or my dad to send me cash, 5,000 naira, I go to the ATM, we do everything and I move on to the next, you know, alert comes in, right? But these banks have gotten my history since then. Till I got my first job, I mean, till I went to NYSE, till my alawi and NYSE increased, till I got my first job, till I got my second job, till I got my third, till I, you know, did everything I had to do. So they have that history. So they can make better decisions because that data about me. They can make better decisions. They know the kind of risk I post to them today because they know that, yes, I know this guy since he was 17. Right? And the same thing for almost all of us that are here today. Yeah. And the question is that, who is getting the current 17-year-olds? Still the banks. Okay, so <laughs> exactly, exactly my point. <laughs> 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 It's still the same people. So it means that if fintechs are not building or getting these people that are not very valuable and making and staying with them all through their journey, they went to school, they come out, they start getting jobs, you know, it's going to be difficult for them to get anything, you know, out of this space. So I don't see them, uh, you know, in any way getting, uh, what's it called, close to... Uh, where the banks are, or close to where the banks are, as of today, I think the banks are still uh, leading the way. Fintechs are not close to taking anything away from them. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> really, really, really interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I was following a trade on Twitter a um, few weeks back, and it was between Inyo was there, um, Victor was there, <laughs> quite a number of them sharing their, their health stories <laughs> that they've, they've taken from startup founders in Nigeria. And then, and then there were stories around founders who give fake data. Um, there are founders who have sconded after raising maybe first tranche 
of funds and then they just well, this is money like probably they're not so sure if the idea itself will even try so like, like a bird in hand so <laughs> let me just it's, let me it's what it tells us with this <laughs> There was even yeah. the, there was even one that he said. He said the guy went for MBA after collecting after raising money. So it, 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 it's it's quite, it's quite an issue. But then these are these are um, singular issues. But then when we bring them together, it becomes a major concern. If this becomes the experience of early investors in that space, mm -hmm. fraud people who have sconed, do you think we're already planting seed of distrust, which can make it harder for legitimate, let's put it out with businesses, to even attract funding, especially yes, okay. in Nigeria? Yes, uh, yes, I, I, I understand uh, perfectly, I mean, where the issue is because I'm 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 in the space, right? I think that in any emerging space, you expect of how 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 it starts. Even the oldest democracy, uh, the US, when they started, they started with bloodshed, right? So it's 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 and then even up until now, they still not. I mean, after years and years of this experiment, they they still they don't seem to have gotten it fully right anyway. So I'm just saying that uh, in any Imagine ecosystem. There are always stories of success and failures, and stories of yeah, I'm, I either made it or not, right? So it's not. Uh, so I'm always worried about the danger of a single story. Okay, so now you're yeah. stealing Chimamada's line. Uh, yeah. Right. So, but we also know that yes, even Inye himself will talk about some of the success stories he has heard with founders in the same country, right? So there are two sides yeah. to. Uh, uh, to the uh, to the coin, so I think that then what do we do? I think we just share our experiences, right? They've shared a few of their bad experiences. They should come out and share some of their great experiences as well, uh, sure. because I know uh, in in few, I mean, again few 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 days ago I was talking about how he had made maybe twenty x on in, on an investment in uh, fifty four gin, right? In months. Right. So again, these are success stories. You put in 10K to something and your 10K dollars is now $20,000 in, in a few months. That's a huge success for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we just share our stories as they, uh, as they come. Of course, bad stories, uh, you know, bad experiences would make people a bit more skeptical around a few things. So it means that next time someone is coming to you, what do you look out for? What do you check? You know, uh, me as a person, I don't invest in a, in a founder. If I don't, believe every word this founder says. I want to invest in your business. If I, if, I, if I think that you have a tendency or you've shown a sign to me that you, you can lie or sugarcoat the truth, I will doubt everything you say from the beginning. And investing is marriage. You know, if I don't trust you, then there's no point you know, starting the relationship in the first place. Right? So I think that's, that's an important part. It just ensures that people, even investors, get learned as, as we grow uh, in, in the space that, okay, uh, formally I will invest immediately, I mean, cut you a check in two days, but now I'll take my time. Wait for two weeks, right, before making this decision because I want to see a few things. Uh, I just checked this. I just checked that. If someone says that they, I made this revenue, I just checked the, the, the bank statements, right? These are things that investors now have to do uh, because I won't throw away the baby and the back water, right? So it means that we need to, you know, just put in a few guard drills, you know, around to, to ensure that, uh, you know, we are able to, uh, to survive uh, anything that comes to us. But again, it's investing. You win some, you lose some. It's, it's just the way the game is played. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, um, uh, we have... Um... I was going to ask the next question around um, COVID nineteen now. Um, like, it's I I think there was one um, there was one report I I can't remember. It was Microsoft that the kind of growth that they expected the market would go into in like two or more years. COVID had pushed the market to it in two months in terms of 
dependence on technology and what have you. So looking at Nigeria, what, what stage of growth do you think COVID-19 is likely to push Nigeria into? And that's one. And the second part of the question will be, is Nigeria ready for that stage of growth? I mean, I'll answer the second first. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a survival of the fittest elimination of your feet. If you're not ready, then you die. I mean, there's really nothing we can do about that. That's how the game is played, right? So you just, you just move on to it. So that's, that's simple. I mean, we, we just better be ready. Uh, if you're not ready, it's a sink or swim situation. We, we, we really have no choice uh, at this point, right? So that's, uh, that's that about that. Uh, for COVID, what do I think? Uh, I mean, I've been argument around, okay, so I saw a Twitter poll around who is, uh, they're asking who was responsible for digital transformation in the organization. Is it the CTO, that's the chief technology officer, is it the CEO, which is the owner, uh, the, the, the managing director of the business, or COVID-19? And it appears to me that for a lot of people, COVID-19 seems to be the determiner, I mean, is, is, the, is one driving technology adoption. You know, I was talking to someone from, a, from, from an investment, no, not from an investment bank, from, from one of the financial services company. And I was talking around uh, how before now they couldn't access their emails from home because the servers are in the office and they're for security reasons, you know, all of this. But somehow, because they have to work from home now, somehow so, something that was not possible before became suddenly possible. Now, I remember uh, during the time of the, of the, 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 the advent of the telecom era, when MTN, Econet were telling us that the technology that drives uh, per second billing is not available in the country. It's going to take a couple of years to, uh, to, to become available. Once Glow showed up with per second billing, suddenly technology that was meant to take a, a couple of years, took two weeks you know, to get available. So COVID is an accelerant. Like it accelerates everything for you, right? So you've been thinking that this is not uh, going to be possible because, I mean, you just have to get used to it. This is going to change our lives forever. Uh, a few things to also note, though, is that we're also fighting two battles, especially on the COVID front. We're fighting an, an healthcare battle. We're fighting an economic battle, mm -hmm. right? On the healthcare side, I think that the success on the healthcare side is nearer to me than success on the economic side. And I'll explain what I mean. On the healthcare side, all we need is a technological breakthrough, vaccine, a drug, and COVID is gone. But if this thing lingers on, the economic impact on people will take years to build back. Right? So that's why I think people or governments are trying to figure out a way to see, can we incorporate COVID into our existence? Can we continue to grow our economy even in the midst of the pandemic? Not shutting down our economy to try and stop the pandemic. Can we continue to, you know, let the economy move around and get ourselves infected? Yeah, <laughs> and still manage it through, but not shutting down the economy because that's, that's the best you're making. But if you don't take some of those beds, you discover that, yes, you lock up your economy for two months, for three months, and still... COVID lingers on, right? And then you, you, you destroy your economy in the, in the process, right? So that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the conundrum that, that we found ourselves. Even the, the, the world's most stable economy, the US, well, arguably, I mean, it's, it's not a stable economy, it's just, you know, they have to figure out a way to open up, <laughs> you, know, you know, their economy gradually because, the president feels that, or the Congress feels that, yeah, I can't continue to have handouts to people. I can't continue. I, this thing has just opened up. We'll figure out a way to deal with this coronavirus as, as, as we live our lives, right? Uh, so I think that for all of these you know, companies that we have in Nigeria, technology adoption has now become a thing of, you know, this is a new reality, this is a new normal. We've just better you know, embrace it because that is where we are as of today. That's where we, we found ourselves. And we just have to, have to find a way to, to adapt to it, you know, and that's, and that's what it is.
uh, for COVID. And it, it, it's impact on businesses, of, of course. Airline businesses are done. Uh, you know, they, they need the economy to open back up. Hotels are, are struggling, you know, as well. But of course, Zoom, Instagram, they're enjoying because, of course, here we are having a meeting and people join us from, from all over the world, right? And I think that's, that's the, so people have their advantages, they have the disadvantages depending on, on, on whose side uh, the pendulum will swing. Then the decision for you as a business is that what do I do to ensure that I turn some of these situations around for myself? And I've started seeing some of those innovative things uh, from people, from some of the businesses that I, had, I mean, I as a person had invested in, right? Uh, Life Bank, for instance, you know, is a blood bank, but now I started doing text, uh, testing kits, you know, supporting on the COVID side, side of things. Uh, you know, Printivo, the printing press, and it's not, and it's not an essential service. But now they they're involved in in the in the merchandise of of personal protective you know equipment, you know, because that's what they do. They have to just keep on figuring out a way to continue to innovate even uh, during crisis, and that's what it pushes us to do. Uh, I I remember my my biology teacher talks about a characteristic of, of, of human beings being Mr. Niger D, but it, it, he now replaced the D with A, saying it's adaptation rather than, than death, because if it's death, it's no longer human. I mean, it's no longer uh, living, right? So, and I think that's, uh, that's that thing that we found ourselves. We have to adapt to the situation we found ourselves. Uh, okay, now, now, now um, COVID is already pushing people to, to be creative. Um, mm -hmm to find ways to get businesses moving despite in spite of the pandemic. So uh, people are trying to, like Riley said, live with it, but still thrive while living with the pandemic. So looking at that, what, what, what disruptions do you think we should be expecting? Um, uh, what opportunities are being thrown open? Okay. Uh... You want me to share my business ideas with you, right? Okay, no problem. That's why I'll, I'll... <laughs> I mean, it's just ideas. It's just ideas. I mean, it's just ideas, right? I mean, fuck it. Anyways, uh, so I think that a few things that we've seen is that uh, businesses that support, uh, you know, our work without us being physically together will continue to try. So we've seen uh, more adoptions on on uh you know what's it called erps enterprise resource planning uh you know that allow people collaborate you know uh, and work from different places uh the idea of co-working spaces will probably be challenged as well but of course there can be distributed co-working spaces so so think for example uh restaurants that are built the, the infrastructure already can you figure out a way to create sections of those physical places to make as offices rather than having everybody com converge at the head office to, you know, to come together. Those are a few opportunities I've seen uh, within the place. Even traditional careers, <coughs> traditional careers uh, like law and all of those things, uh, we've started seeing technology adoption in some of those uh, places, uh, delivering justice via, you know, video conferencing, you know, all of that show up opportunities around how can I, you know, Digitize the legal system, you know, for for Nigeria specifically, uh, you know, as as we're as we thinking around it, how can I digitize the court processes? How can I allow judges to sit in their houses, listen to cases from lawyers? Again, this is building, knowing the fact that there is infrastructure challenge from both ends because lawyers have does does have stable internet, the judges have stable internet. You know, how do we do? How do we work around uh, all of this? How do we also move people around? Right, uh, you know, again, do we continue to, to, to do public transport the way we're doing it today? You know, uh, I, was, I was watching some video about how to disinfect people in seconds, right? How do you incorporate that into our normal life? So it means that bus stops have these, you know, things around, you know, disinfecting their people as these are just opportunities that open up that, that they were never there, uh, there before. But finally, if I go, I think that I'm also weary of businesses that are succeeding only because of COVID. By the time COVID leaves, what happens to them, right? So for me, I will figure out, I will try to continue to think around how to think about the, the, 
not not just businesses that, that are brought about by COVID, businesses that that adapt during COVID and thrive outside of it, or business that can start during COVID and thrive even with or without it. And I think we should start thinking in that in that direction as well. Mm. So, so, so let, let's let's look at this. Um, so we're already talking about ideas now. Um, so so let's 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 think from the perspective of <clears throat> of a new guy that is trying to um, come in. So you have an idea. It looks good. Um, good. Like, it's something that you think I'm trying. So what are the next steps after that idea that an entrepreneur needs for the idea to try, to bring the idea to life? Let's even talk about bringing it to life in the first instance. So what are the steps that you need to do um, most especially to attract funding. Since, yes, since, I mean, since you see all manner of ideas every day, what, what are yes. those, um, yeah, unique things that separate ideas? So, uh, so for me, ideas are great, but that's just what it is. Great, nothing more, right? Uh, someone had said, I think it was. Like Tyson has said that everybody seems to have a strategy until you get punched in the face, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So people, I mean, I'm, I'm a boxer, I have this great plan, that like, this I'm going to defeat the boxer. But once Tyson Fury eats you once, you're like, ah, okay, this thing is not, it's not making it's sense so again. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, so for me, uh, I guess it's just what it is. There's nothing there. Uh, your job as an entrepreneur is number one to validate those ideas, uh, and I think that, is, and it's one of the reasons why I like uh, I have I like some certain kind of entrepreneurs. Mrs. D, uh, right? I like some certain kind of of entrepreneurs uh, because they are. I, I will look into their face and know that. This guy, if I support you, if I back you up, this guy will, will what's it called? With or without money, this guy will pursue this idea and finish it, right? I need to be able to see that conviction in the face of every entrepreneur I'm, I'm trying to back. So it's not like, uh, for me, I also think I like ideas that you stumble into, right? So meaning that maybe I'm solving for one problem before, right? Uh, and I'm sorry for one problem before. And I found out that the way people are using my product is different. Then you eat it, right? So a lot of times, sitting down in the, in the house and strategizing about right? Not in this uh, region, not in Nigeria, right? I would like you to see something more. 10 people are using this product. 20 people have started using it. This one referred his friend. That one did this. This is what they are doing. That for me is the validation of an idea. Not just uh, I have this bright, brilliant idea in my house and I'm sitting down around it. So for me, you know, that's not just enough. But I, quickly, just to answer your question, the way I think about that, five things I look out for, uh, you know, five T's, the way uh, the, 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 the article I copied, you know, I put it. So that the team, who are the people behind this uh, this this product, right? In this context, that the founder, the technology person, you know, the business people in there. What's the dynamics between them? Because one thing you don't want to do as an investor is to is to get is is to have businesses that the founders are fighting, right? When founders fight, the business struggle, the business suffer for it. Sometimes you have to fire founders. It's a difficult process. You don't want to get involved in that. So you in, in a pitch meeting some time ago, uh, two co-founders, no, three of them were in the meeting. Uh, three co-founders, I looked at the cap table, I saw that, yes, two of them seem to be, like all animals are equal, but some are more equal than the others, right? So these two co-founders seem to be senior to this third co-founder. And we're at that meeting, they were pitching, the business, and then I heard the CEO tell, like, take note. Like, ah, uh -uh. be your co-founder and you're sitting down from your own seat telling the other co-founder to be jotting 
it's just something about it. Of course, I, did, I moved back to that kind of a thing because I know that there's trouble at the end of this, of this thing. Of course, they split up eventually and the business is, is, is somewhere else. I don't know where they are, right? That's one. The team is important to me. Then number two, the technology. In Nigeria, you can't just do technology for technology's sake. So it means that your technology has to be solving a deep problem. You can't. But for me, I want to get so you can't just build that for me because you can't build it. No, I don't care. You know, that's technology uh, for me. The third thing is the is the you know time, the target, the addressable market. How large is this opportunity? You know, how big is it? There are some great ideas that the they are not you know uh, the 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 number of users are not going to be great. You know, they're not, the, the size of the market is not huge enough. So for me, it's like, okay, can I, how big can this opportunity, you know, potentially be? Then the third thing is about traction. It's important for me to see. Again, I'm not a soothsayer, right? I can't sit down here and say that this business will work, that business won't work. Maybe I can, but the things that push me to make my check, to invest, is that I love this product, did it better, 100 people showed up in two hours. Huh. You know, and I think it's important to also notice that as an investor myself, I've learned this over the, over the years that I should, I am not, I'm not the user of it. Kaizen platform, right? Better than that, I want to use my car as an alternative platform that people should be using their cars you know, as crowdsourced uh, advertising. So it means that I'm driving my car to the office. I have Indomie ads on it. I felt it was a brilliant idea myself because I can use my car for it. Until I start speaking to people, they're like, my car is my baby. Like, how can your car be your baby? It doesn't make sense. Your car cannot be your baby now. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> but for me, I could use my car for that. But a lot of people cannot. Right? So I, I discovered quickly that I am not... I am not the target market. So there are some businesses that are backed that I might not be able to use the product, but there are enough people that will use that product. I will back the business irrespective because it's not about me. It's not about how I feel as a user. I mean, if I was the only person here, Instagram would, would never be a thing. There's no way. Instagram would never be a thing. In, if, if, if it's only my kind of people that are in the world, Instagram will never thrive. But of course, I'm wrong because Instagram is thriving. So it means that I am not... My kind are not the only people in the, in the world. I think it's just the way uh, things are, uh, business are done. Uh, right, so team, tech, traction, uh, time. I think the final thing is team, tech, traction. I can't remember. One, fi one final thing I look out for, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I look for a few of those things in, in different degrees to see this is what I look out for in a business that I that will back uh, today. Mm. That, 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 that's, that's interesting. Um, and so, so you as, as an investor now, um, how bullish are you on Nigeria's um, tech space? How bullish are you? Um, how bullish am I? <laughs> I am actually very bullish. If I'm not convinced, I won't be here. I won't be doing this, right? Uh, okay. I'm bullish. Let me tell you why I'm a seed investor. It's, it's, it's important you know why. Because imagine I put in $25,000 in a business. Okay, let's say I put in $50,000 in a business. It's valued at 500K. Okay. So it means that with $50,000, I own, you know, 10, uh, five, no. 10%. What? 10% of the business. 50 or 500. That's, that's 10%. Yes. 50 or 500. Yes. 10% of the business. I want 10% of the business today. Imagine 